A few days ago I posted a video showing me building this power supply. It's based on the Ryden RD6012 switching front end controller and I bought all the parts I needed, the enclosure, the Ryden controller and the power supply as a kit of parts so in theory this should all fit together and work without any issues. I was a bit dubious about this because the power supply was rated at 11.4 amps. Of course it is a switching supply so in theory it doesn't need the full 12 amps uh, input if it's a higher voltage but of course the Ryden's not 100% efficient so uh, working all this out uh, we needed a bit more than um, 800 watts to uh, fully drive the uh, Ryden supply. Uh, and on top of that, uh, these uh, supplies aren't normally intended to be run um, flat out continuously. You'd normally rate them down at 80% or less if you want to run them 100% uh, of the time. And in fact, most manufacturers of these supplies do specify that. Uh, this supplier didn't seem to do that. It might be in the spec somewhere, but I didn't see it anywhere. Uh, but either way, it means that this supply didn't really seem to be suitable for this application. But I wanted to buy it all because it was sold as a kit and put it together and see what happens. If you watched my series on the uh, Ryden RD6006, that's a 360 watt supply, which is half of this one, I used a 600 watt switching uh, back end for that. And really, you'd have to recommend really, you know, a minimum of a 1000 watt um, back end switching supply. Um, ideally 1200 watts if you can find one that will fit in the case. They, they are available, they're not uh, particularly cheap um, but obviously you want something that's going to survive. If you're only going to use the peak current and or peak voltage then that's probably not going to be an issue but if you want to run this at full power um, then you might find this supply uh, isn't going to be suitable. Uh, in the follow-up video I did, I ran this uh, continuously and just on an hour this supply failed. And uh, I was interested to see if it uh, was a one-off failure or if there was something um, that could be done thermally to uh, allow it to run continually. I somehow doubted it without making modifications but I wanted to give it a go anyway. The original device uh, that had failed was the a steering diode, so it's a dual diode. It's rated at uh, 30 amps, 600 volts, which you think would be fine for uh, what is a, essentially a 12 amp supply. But bear in mind, this is not a pass device. It's not passing the 12 amps. It's switching very high peak currents uh, via an inductor to ground. Uh, well, that's effectively what it's doing. And um, it means the peak currents can be much higher than the uh, output currents and really a function of the power it's putting out rather than the current. So with that in mind I thought I'd do a few experiments. So firstly I tried just fitting a replacement device, uh, run it through the same test and after about 30 minutes I had an identical failure and uh, it's one of the two diodes in the pack going short circuit and it uh, obviously kills the supply. Uh, luckily it hasn't yet damaged the uh, Ryden, the power just disappears but nothing seems to get through that does it any real harm um, but either way uh, it wasn't going to work the way it was. So I started looking at this a bit further and it's, it seems that the rest of the supply can easily handle the power output, it's just this device uh, keeps failing. Now on the face of it it should be fine. I've looked at the um, signal uh, this is um, subject to the power uh, pulses and they don't seem too bad they're a bit uh, misshapen a bit noisy but uh, fundamentally it should be okay but I think what's happening is the um, the junction temperature is starting to get too high it's not really a function of the heatsink temperature. I did try fitting a fan to this as well as part of a, a test and it made no difference. Um, I've had these fail now three times all the same way uh, between 30 minutes and an hour. Um, the heatsink gets up to about 50 degrees centigrade. Even if you keep it down to 30, I still got the same failure. And I think it's the, uh, the junction temperature is getting too high. Now, if we look at the spec sheet for this device, we can kind of see this is predictable. 
So the one we're interested in here is this uh, top graph and you can see that the forward current derating curve is pretty much flat at 30 amps up to a little over 120 centigrade which is what we'd expect the junction temperature to be. Uh, bear in mind the junction temperature at high power is much higher than the heatsink temperature due to the thermal conductivity of the package. Uh, and we can see that it drops off very quickly and by the time we get to 150 centigrade uh, which is not actually all that high for a junction temperature then we're down to zero current so uh, 10 amps is at about 140 centigrade uh, 20 amps at about 130 so you can see we have a very sharp drop off and I think we're entering this phase uh, with junction temperature and then it's just dying with uh, forward current causing the junction to break down so what we could do about that is obviously reduce the current flowing through each junction and uh, one way to do that would be to uh, double up the number of diodes so I decided to give that a go that's what I'm doing in this video I uh, haven't tried it yet so I want to try that uh, in this video just to show you what I'm, I'm doing in terms of going about this so the first question is how to get uh, two packages wired up the right way and if we look at the back of the board it might well be a lot easier than it might first sound. This is going to be quite hard to see on camera but these three centre holes are the holes that the original device was mounted in so it was originally mounted like this with the three pins in the three centre holes uh, but if we look at the tracks there are footprints for other packages alongside and if we look at the way this is configured bear in mind these are uh, dual diodes and the center pin is common cathode then if we look at the uh, center hole then we can see that uh, if we take the center hole here on this package it comes through to the same point and if we take the center hole here on this package then again that comes through to the center pin the outer two pins come to the same point on one side of this package and the outer two pins on here um, come to the um, other pin on the uh, same centre package. There's a jumper here on the other side of the board so these two points are connected together. What that means is we can effectively treat each package uh, if we use the outer two footprints as uh, a dual diode in parallel rather than using each of the two diodes in the package individually and what that will do is it will uh, give us two diodes per branch rather than one and obviously that's going to halve the uh, current through each of the two diodes or pretty much depending on how um, well matched they are. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to fit uh, one dual diode on this side and another one on this side and that will actually give us exactly the same configuration uh, as we would have fitting one in the center uh, except that we've got two diodes per package in each branch if you don't quite believe me then what I'll do is just buzz the circuit out so got our trusty meter and if we now buzz this out if we go from the center pin to the center pin on this side you can see it's connected if we go from the center pin on this side to the center pin on this side that's also connected if we go to this left hand pin it's connected to the two outers on this package and on this side it isn't quite sold at the moment so it might be difficult getting a, um, a good uh, path through here we can see that's connected as is that so in other words the board layout lends itself quite nicely to this setup so I'll give this a go I'll get it uh, mounted I'll get them bolted to the heatsink get them soldered in place and then we'll run it back up firstly see if it works at all uh, and then we'll run it up to full power and leave it running for a few hours and see if it survives okay so I've got a pair of diodes bolted in now kind of hard to see them uh, tucked in there on either end of the heatsink. I uh, would point out uh, here that if you really wanted to you could fit 
uh, three of these to the heat sink and with the board footprint being the way it is then you'd effectively get three diodes in each branch uh, rather than the two that I've got here. Uh, but I want to test just two, see how it works. Um, it did survive for an hour before so in theory uh, cutting the peak current down to half what it was should give us a, a huge advantage. Should cause the heatsink to get slightly hotter because we're actually getting more of the heat being generated to the actual heatsink and um, that in theory should also help keep the uh, dissipation per junction down as well. So we'll give this a go and uh, see if it actually works to start with. Uh, now high frequency switching, it might be that the drive circuits don't like it and uh, refuse to uh, operate correctly. Uh, off camera I will do a bit of, bit of investigation, check the waveforms and see if um, it looks uh, as it should. Um, but the first thing I want to do is see if it will actually boot up at all and uh, give us any power. So let's get it plugged in. I'm using the uh, bench auto transformer. Uh, it's got a, a 5 amp trip so it's a bit safer than plugging this directly into the mains. Get the test meter. And of course what we're looking for here is that it will generate uh, around 70 volts which is what it should be doing. I'll adjust it later. I won't leave it running too long because I don't have a heatsink on the main switching devices. I can't uh, really fit that until I've got the uh, board bolted back into its uh, chassis. But I just want to see if it's capable of running in its current form. So we'll get it switched on. So 69 volts. 60 milliamps, which is a bit lower than it was before. So that looks quite promising. It looks like it might be actually switching better than it was. Uh, so what I'll do now is get this fitted back into the switching chassis get it back into the Ryden, see if the Ryden still works and then we'll um, try a full power test and see if it survives. Okay, a touch of deja vu here. I've got it all assembled and uh, you can just about see the two diodes down in there. Um, as I say, it should have the peak current through each one and uh, that will give us um, a very good return in terms of keeping the junction temperature uh, within the device a lot lower. Just to answer a question that um, came up in the comments as to where I fitted the temperature sensor. Uh, firstly the sensor is meant for battery charging but uh, because I'm not going to use this unit for charging batteries and in fact I will modify it and uh, use the green terminal as a mains ground. Um, I'm using the temperature sensor internally to monitor the hottest part of the system which is what I was doing before. And what I've got the sensor mounted is I've drilled a hole into the end of the heatsink. So this is the hotter, hottest part of the system. And I determined that with a thermal camera. I've bored a hole and it goes halfway down through the heatsink. Fill it with thermal paste and then the temperature sensor is pushed into that hole. Uh, so it gives a very good uh, sensing of the temperature of this particular heatsink. Okay, the rest of it's uh, all assembled. I just want to boot it up uh, again before we give it a full power test to make sure it's still working. And as we can see, it is working. One other thing I want to do before I go on and uh, give it a full test is I, I still think that the fan is temperature controlled to a certain degree and I will be modifying this because at the moment it's running, but I think it's kind of running in its standby speed. I think it will go faster and there's what appears to be a temperature sensor sitting here. It's just in free air at the moment, but I'm just going to try and heat it up with a soldering iron and see if the fan speeds up. I've got a feeling the fan's going to switch into high gear if I heat that sensor up. So I'll just grab a soldering iron and I'll put the microphone close to the fan so you can hear it more clearly. And so yeah, sure enough, if you heat up the sensor, um, the fan speeds up. So uh, I'll be modifying this and all I'm going to do is rather than fitting a complete new sensor, I'm just going to put a threshold uh, a level detector in here. So with the voltage low as it is now on the fan slow speed, the fan will be stopped or turning very slowly so I can't hear it. And then um, when the threshold 
that it's using to speed the fan up is exceeded, then it will turn the fan on. Uh, so all I'm doing is effectively bringing it down a couple of gears, but it will run at its full speed. So the only disadvantage, it's most likely going to be either off or running at its uh, full speed. But um, if the 6006 is anything to go by, it's not going to come on that frequently anyway. Okay, so I'll get the top cover put back on. We'll get the Kunkin loads out and uh, give it another full load test and see if this time it survives. Okay, so we're ready for another full power test and see how it uh, fares this time. Starting temperature for the heatsink is 26 degrees centigrade and um, we'll give it a run and see how it goes. I've got the two loads set to one amp. I've got it set to 60 volts out, so we might as well start at uh, full power out and we'll turn the two loads on and currently we're at 120 watts go up to 4 amps so 240 watts to 6 amps So we're now at 360 watts, so this is the um, limit for the RD6006. Uh, and now what I'll do is I'll go right up to 12 amps and we'll see what happens with the supply. Okay, so we're at 720 watts. Um, I'll leave it running like this for a while and uh, hopefully it will survive. But I'll keep an eye on the heat sink temperature. It's currently up at 29 degrees. Uh, it went up to I think about 45 last time so uh, we'll see if there's any difference and um, if the um, supply survives. Okay well it's been running for about an hour and a half now and it's still looking fine. We're up to about 45-46 watts. I'm just going to take it down a bit. The fans are getting a bit noisy on the Kunkins so um, I'm not quite sure if you can hear me or not. Uh, th they're supposed to do that, that's just because they're pumping out a lot of heat. Um, in fact, I'll turn these off. It's, so it's been running for an hour and a half, so if it was going to do something, I'm sure it would have by now. Uh, but the temperature's got up to 46 degrees. It's only a degree or so, so cooler than it was before, but I was kind of expecting that. I don't think it was the heat sink temperature as such that was the issue. I think it was the junction temperature within the devices themselves. Um, but what I'll do now is I'll uh, turn this back up to uh, full power. I'll go right up to, six, to uh, 60 volts at 12.2 amps and um, I'll just leave it running and see what happens but hopefully this is a, a long-term cure. I'd still recommend going for a higher power back-end switching supply um, but if you do have one of these supplies then this is certainly uh, possibly a modification that's worth making and it will definitely um, add to the uh, serviceability and durability of the uh, switching supply. Um, if anything does come of the testing, um, if I leave it running and it fails, uh, we'll see how long it takes to fail, but I will be running this at full power, so just bear in mind that if you just need 12 amps but lower voltage or the 60 volts at lower current, you're less likely to encounter a problem. This is uh, mostly an, is an issue due to the power output, full power, rather than uh, the actual current. Okay, uh, any comments welcome. Um, if you want to see any particular testing for this, then let me know. Um, as I say, anything comes up with the testing once it's left running, and uh, I'll post another video uh, as an update.